I'm Dr. Gail Gross, and I'm here today with Jack Kemp, the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Mr. Kemp is a key spokesman for growth and opportunity in America. He served for nine terms in the United States House of Representatives before his appointment to the Cabinet. Jack Kemp has proven to be one of our nation's most innovative leaders, encouraging entrepreneurship and job creation in impoverished neighborhoods and expanding home ownership among the poor. He is co-author of the book Opportunity and Progress, a bipartisan platform for national housing policy. And I might add, Jack Kemp led the Buffalo Bills as a quarterback to the American Football League Championship in 1964 and 1965, where he was named Most Valuable Player. Welcome, Jack. Thank you, Gail. Pleasure. Well, it's a delight to have you. And Thanks I'm, for the nice introduction. Well, it's all true. You're an inspiration. And I was wondering, I know something so close to your heart is home ownership. And it's risen on an all-time high in the last few years. How do you suggest that we continue expanding the success to the lower-income families? Well, that's the real challenge. Uh, Seventy percent almost of the American people own their own home, which is wonderful because ownership gives you dignity, creates social justice, gives an anchor to the community, and really fosters the type of, I would say, value system that's so important to our Judeo-Christian roots. Having said that, less than 40 percent of black Americans and, for, and less than 40 percent of Hispanic Americans own their own home. So if we really want to foster in urban America and in low-income communities, as you pointed out a little bit earlier, the type of value system, the type of social justice, the type of pride and dignity that goes along with ownership, it seems to me that we've got to have special incentives in the tax code to encourage it. And then number two, we've got to have a special I would say tax incentive in urban America, like an enterprise zone where taxes are radically altered, lower that is, mm -hmm. in order to provide the type of, of influx of capital investment that would not only create jobs but create the type of uh, construction of housing and ownership of housing that's so important to the things that we've been talking about. We talk of, of housing as being such a national priority, and I know it affects the economy mm -hmm. dramatically. Talk to us about that. Well, housing and ownership of housing is about 20% of our GDP. Mm -hmm. Our GDP is $11 trillion a year and rising. Right. So that's a huge industry. It's a heavily regulated industry, far too regulated, I believe. Mm -hmm. There are so many regulations. We've driven affordable housing out of many communities. Yes. I think it's a huge issue for this country and one that uh, Henry Cisneros, former Secretary yes. of Housing, and I have yes. championed together, one Democrat, one Republican, mm -hmm. uh, tr to try to lift housing uh, onto the national radar screen so it becomes something debated between both parties. Uh, President Bush has been talking about an ownership culture, an ownership society mm -hmm. where people own their own home, own their own education, own their own retirement account. Mm -hmm. I think that's type of effort. It has to come from both parties, to yes. be sure, but I'm glad President Bush has championed it. But it would, in my view, democratize mm -hmm. our capitalistic, free enterprise, private property-based system in America so that low-income people have those rungs of the ladder to launch their version of the American dream. Do you think that both po parties get it? Do the Republicans and the Democrats see this challenge? I think they see the challenge generically. Mm. I think both parties need to do more of it. I can remember when I was Secretary of Housing, I uh, had an idea that in public housing, we should give people, low-income people, the type of federal tax breaks, the federal buying down of a mortgage, encourage ownership in public housing that would condominiumize uh, a public housing project if people wanted it. Interesting. Um, I can remember people getting up on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives and said things like, if Jack Kemp has his way, low-income people will own their own apartment in a public housing mm -hmm. unit, and they'll turn around someday and sell it and make a profit. And I great said, idea. Absolutely <laughs> great idea. You know, that's what my mother and dad did, right. not out of public housing, but out mm -hmm. of a small business in Los Angeles, California. Another person said, well, if Kemp has his way, people will own their own uh, apartment and 
they'll get old and die and they'll leave it to their children. And I said, yeah, I mean, that's I what did. my family did. <laughs> uh, I think this idea of the American dream is more generic than uh -huh. both political parties suggest. It really is a universal dream. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need to do is challenge both political parties to come up with an agenda that will expand affordable housing, expand opportunities for people to own, particularly mm -hmm. in urban America, people of color, ethnic minorities, and uh, what we can do to uh, provide a, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to deregulate the industry in the sense that we're going to have laissez-faire. Right. I know we have to have regulations Rules. for the air and the water right. and even endangered species, mm -hmm. but I really think we've got to take a look at housing and figure out what regulations are efficacious uh, and what are inhibiting developers and home builders from providing the type of affordable housing and home ownership opportunities for particularly the middle class and lower income people. Because too many rules, of course, just send the price up. I mean, that's Absolutely. happened in Colorado, for an example. Colorado, Southern California, California. Uh, New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, to meet New all, York. Mm -hmm. To meet all those regulations. I'm the national chairman costs. of Habitat for Humanity, and we're going to spend... I built a house for Habitat. Did you really? I did. Well, I've, I've been national cha uh, uh, chairman for the More Than Houses campaign to build 100,000 homes. I wasn't a homes. good builder. Well, I was neither. <laughs> but I'm good at raising money, and it's become so... Um, popular mm -hmm. among college students, mm -hmm. among people all over the country, all over the world. I went yes. to Africa for Habitat and the mm -hmm. Sullivan Foundation, and we built uh, 26 homes in Nigeria. And I, I was absolutely amazed at how on the African continent, people want the same things that Paul and Francis Kemp wanted for their four boys back in Los Angeles, California in exactly. the 40s and 50s. Exactly. Long time ago, but not at it's all. It's still alive. Still alive. You know, they, it was sort of, as you say, the American dream, like a chicken in every pot and everyone owning their own home. Own, owning a home. Uh, I can remember when um, Queen Elizabeth literally saw a show. I, I forget what it was, 60 Minutes or some mm -hmm. TV show, maybe even your show. And uh, I was Secretary of Housing, and she wanted to see in southeast Washington, D.C., a low-income community that began to own their own home. Uh -huh. And she came to one person's home. I was the interlocutor. I was going to make the introductions. And she came with Barbara Bush back in the mm -hmm. Bush uh, administration, Bush 1 administration. So I was supposed to introduce her to the Queen. And before I could introduce this woman who'd been on welfare for most of her life, owned her own home, was so proud of it, so proud that Barbara Bush and Queen Elizabeth were coming to her home. She elbowed me out of the way, ran down the stairs, I grabbed remember, the queen, and, hugged and her. picked the queen up uh, <laughs> off her that. feet like that. And they asked her why she violated the rules of protocol. She uh -huh. said, well, it was the American thing to do. I remember And that. then she said something I've never forgotten, and, and I'm glad you remember it because I want your audience to hear this. Mm -hmm. She said, her name's Alice Frazier. She lives mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., and I know her well. <laughs> and she said, uh, besides, I wanted the queen to see my palace. Wonderful. And, and of course, it affects everything. Absolutely. Your sense of self, your self-esteem, the way you walk in the world. If you have some ownership, it changes you. There's no Absolutely. question about it. I tell college kids and so I said, have you ever sent your rental car to a car wash? Right. You know, as soon as you own something, you treat it differently than when you don't. Well, what happens when the housing opportunity is not there for a family? Well, uh, I think it affects uh, their attitude towards uh, the community, towards mm -hmm. the country, towards their future. I think it turns uh, a long-run view into a very short-term existential view. You think about just barely surviving, barely getting by. Mm -hmm. I don't want to turn this into too dramatic, but I, I really think that uh, a strong commitment to ownership helps solidify a community, helps establish a value system, as I pointed out earlier, helps anch give an anchor to the community, helps children grow up with a sense of the dignity and, and social mm -hmm. justice that comes with a country that we expect of America. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we've made great strides, even among uh, ethnic and, and people of color. We've mm -hmm. made great strides. And I think when families have home ownership, they feel they have a piece of the pie. Absolutely. They're invested, and in a certain way, they're invested in the outcome. They, I think they vote more, they're, they're in, in involved in their community more because it's plus you Plus, you can leverage that ownership mm -hmm. into capital formation. Right. You can 
take out a second mortgage. mortgage. My father and mother in the 1940s, my dad was a truck driver. Yes. They mortgaged their home in Los Angeles in the 40s and my dad bought that truck and started his trucking company mm -hmm. with a second mortgage on our home in Los Angeles. And he made a profit and uh, shocking to some, uh, turned the profit into Fantastic. a second truck and into a third truck and built a little trucking company in Southern California that put four boys through college. Yes. Now, I think the real American dream Mm -hmm. is to be able to start out as a truck driver and someday be a trucking owner. Of course. To start out as a worker in a restaurant and maybe someday buy the restaurant. Right. And I think my friends on the left, if you don't mind me making a little political point here, it's I'm sure you'll get some, some email on this, but it, I think it's a valid one. The worker and the investor are not two separate people at opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. They're the same people, but at different stages of their life. Mm -hmm. We all work to save and save to invest and invest in order to build something for our children, our family, and our future. And I think if, if that is available, mm -hmm. you can turn workers into capitalists. Exactly. Labor into capital. And I think that's the real dream of a fluid system. And uh, I noticed the other day... The bottom quintile of workers in America uh, are uh, suffering from the economy, mm -hmm. um, and they do when unemployment strikes and recessions hit. Right. But as the economy recovers, as you work and learn, and young workers become young savers and mm -hmm. homeowners, 40% mm -hmm. of the bottom quintile in the last five years have moved up into the next quintile. Exactly. That's what we want to see in this yes. country. The fluidity and the dynamism mm -hmm. of an economy lets people climb up that ladder. And social mobility. Absolutely. And it all comes from that feeling that if I do something better than somebody else, I get a reward for it. And home ownership is that reward. I really think, and, and I'm an Anglo, you know, Republican, uh, so I, I can't speak for people of color. Yes. But to make a comment about this, I really think it, it eases the tensions among ethnic minorities and racial minorities. I think uh, when you're getting an education, when you've got a job, when you're, when you're competitive in the economy, you are taken a lot more seriously. I don't want to make course. it, I'm not an economic determinist, right. but I'm a great believer that if the tide is rising mm -hmm. and the boats are rising with it, uh, I think it eases some of the illiberal tensions mm -hmm, between mm -hmm. people and ethnic groups and races. Well, they, they say that the majority of millionaires come out of the blue-collar sector. Yep. They just worked really hard because they want to get out. And started their own business. And start their own business. That's very true. Incidentally, women-owned businesses create more jobs in the United States of America than the Fortune 500 to have in the last 10 years. This is true, and it's getting bigger and better. It's huge. I mean, it's huge. And we, uh, I, because of time of life and women outliving men, they really handle a dramatic amount of the wealth of this country. Yes, they do. So when you make all that money, the next thing you're interested in is your taxes. And, you know, that's become a very big part of our political environment today, tax uh, code. Everybody has talked about tax reform for the last generation, yet the tax code has gotten more complicated yes. and is now way beyond the average person's comprehension. How do you see simplifying and reforming our tax code? Well, I uh, led a tax reform commission uh, in 1996 uh, prior to the presidential election. And we came to the conclusion that the tax code, and I'm sure you came to this conclusion a priori, yes. before the fact, that yes. most people have, is confusing, cumbersome, contradictory, confiscatory, <laughs> and it, it corrupts decision making. Yes. You, you think, it does. what will this dollar earned, should I earn it and spend it? Should I earn it and invest it? Should I earn it and shelter it? Or should I stop earning or because stop I'm earning working go, for the government? Go to Vail and, and right. ski for exactly. uh, the weekend. Exactly. Um, I'm a great believer in simplification. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what the rate should be, but I think it should be lower than what it is today. Mm -hmm. I think the poor should be exempt from paying any mm -hmm. income tax. I think it, you could have graduation within a flat tax system or a simplified tax mm -hmm. code by having a large exemption up to 160 or 180 percent of the poverty level mm -hmm. so that as you earn, as you begin to earn enough, then you would pay a 20 or 22 or I don't know, I'd pay 25 easily. Mm -hmm. But this is interesting, Gail. 
stop and think about it this way. If you earn a dollar of income and you mm -hmm. spend it, you pay one income tax, you pay a sales tax, but you pay only one income tax. Right. So you get the benefit of the consumption uh, and you only pay one income tax. If you save it, you pay again. If you invest it, you pay capital gains. Mm -hmm. Capital gain taxes are not indexed to inflation, even though the income tax is. Mm -hmm. And then if you die, which is a distinct possibility at some point, you pay another tax, the death tax. Yes. Dying is a taxable event. Yes. Um, I, I believe in taxing all income. Tax mm -hmm. all income, but mm -hmm. just tax it once. Once. Tax it at 20 or 22. Uh, I think we'd get more revenue. We'd get a bigger pie. Uh, I think less people trying to escape people could fill out their taxes on a postcard mm -hmm. I know what they're gonna say watching the show that this is overly simplistic overly uh, um, Idealistic and maybe it is but I think if we had a national referendum mm -hmm. on this issue mm -hmm. and gave people the choice of paying a flat income tax say of 22 percent with an exemption for the poor and the, and the working poor or continue and pay in the current system, I think people would choose to opt out into a simplified flat income tax that they could use on a postcard or pay on a postcard. Absolutely. You know, Thomas Jefferson said, a country that taxes its people is no longer free. And our whole country began, you know, on the uh, idea or the premise of taxation without representation is right. tyranny, but we had the Boston Tea Party, and, and it was such an anathema to our culture, and yet here we are. I, some I think people will pay the tax. I think tax. people will pay a tax if they think mm -hmm. it's simple, fair, and, and, and raises revenue mm -hmm. I for think needed fair, government spending. Fair is the key there. Yeah. And I think 40% uh, of really all, inc uh, all of our income tax is paid really by a very small minority. 20% of the income payers in America, mm -hmm. income tax payers in America pay eight, the top 20 pay 84% of all tax revenues. Amazing. The top 2% pay 40% of all revenues. Yes, I've is. always said, if you want to soak the rich, <laughs> bring the rates down right. to where they have no incentive to go offshore, mm -hmm. no incentive to go into tax-free municipal bonds, mm -hmm. no incentive to just get a lawyer and obfuscate the tax code. Exactly. Get them to invest. That's where investment should be going, towards jobs and creating new opportunities for the next generation of uh, entrepreneurs. It's so interesting when you consider that the income tax really came after World War I. And it was a half... It actually came a little... It came, was it 19... 13, 14? Yeah, mm -hmm. it came to the early years of World, World War I, War I. Actually. And it was really one half percent in the beginning, and they were going to put a six percent ceiling, and Congress said that was so high, the American public would never... Yeah. Never yeah. accept that. Yeah. You know, we've come a long way, and we need <laughs> revenue. You know, yes. we need revenue. I, I've never been one to say cut the income tax rate to lose revenue. I've right. always said, John F. Kennedy said, tax rates can be so high as to cause tax revenues to be too low. Mm -hmm. So I think people make a confusion. I think people are confused by the tax rate not being the same as tax revenue. Yes. You can get tax rates so high, revenue goes down. And yes. that was what we tried to prove when Reagan cut the tax rates in 1981. Revenue actually went up. Everybody talks about reforming Social Security. The Congress is afraid or unable to touch it, and we all remember the now infamous empty lockbox from the Gore-Bush debates. Yeah. So what needs to be done to Social Security, and what are the chances that anything will really happen before we reach a, a national crisis? Well, the crisis will come in about 20 to 25 years. Something has to be done, preferably sooner rather than later, although Congress tends to act only in a crisis atmosphere. People are afraid it's the third rail of American politics, and if you touch it, you, you know, you'll get defeated. And, but that isn't true. Elizabeth Dole ran on it in North Carolina, ran on individual retirement accounts, and did very well. So I think that election victory by Elizabeth Dole does give hopefully some politicians a chance to say you can run on individual retirement accounts it'll get a better rate of return for younger workers give people the option of staying in the system to protect their current social security if they want to retire on social security alone or they can at young age put sick half of their payroll tax into a personal retirement account and get eight to nine percent rate of return instead of what a government funded right. bond gets at like one percent return so if we look at this challenge of, of social security today and and what we're facing today what further recommendations would you have to get the congress to not be afraid and to move on it 
we've got to have a consensus between Democrats and Republicans, between liberals and conservatives, that it can be done, and we can yes. use borrowed funds to uh, to handle the transition costs. And um, frankly, I think there's got to be a national debate. Ultimately, there's got to be a national referendum. The only way to really move the political system is with a referendum. Exactly. And that's why this issue has to be at the forefront of talk shows, uh, TV and radio. Uh, yes. My columns, I write on it regularly. And I think more and more politicians, more and more political leaders are willing to challenge the status quo. Yes, because originally this was put in place by Roosevelt as a temporary fund, really, an insurance. It was, it was to be one leg of a three-leg yes. system, a, a business pension, your own private pension, and then the Social Security. And there were 20 workers working for every one retiree. Now there's only two and a half workers working for every one retiree. So we've got to exactly. do something and do it soon. And it was never really structured to grow the way no. we've grown it. Oh. 12.5% of the payroll tax. Amazing. The payroll tax is the highest tax most people pay. Exactly. We know of your deep commitment and involvement in the problem of terrorism. What can we do to really reduce this worldwide threat? I really believe the United States should offer, uh, with the cooperation of the moderate Arab states, of which there are many, a 21st century martial aid plan for the Islamic world, like we did post-World War II, West Europe, West, Western Europe, Europe and West Germany, Europe. and in Japan. Yes. Everybody said Japan could not be right. converted right. from a Shinto-based militaristic society to a democratic one. Yes. And today, Japan, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, uh, the Philippines, these are democratic societies a lot right. of people didn't think could be created. And I think the same thing can be done in the Arab world. There are many Arab leaders who would like to join us in something like this. They just don't want it to be shoved down their throats. Right. And how do you deal with the propaganda machines that we... Well, I with. think it would give us what I call soft diplomacy. We do need hard diplomacy now and then. Uh, and I understand hard diplomacy, telling somebody that if they get out of bounds, we're going to have to strike. Uh, but the soft diplomacy are the type of things that would engage the Arab world in trade opportunities, in investment opportunities, Wonderful. in economic opportunity, in education. And we've got to do it again by engaging them in a real sincere way to listen to their complaints about yes. the treatment of, of the U.S., uh, their past grievances with us. Uh, we have to help create the type of a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian yes. challenge that would allow for two people to live side by side. Um, that's difficult, yes. but I think we have to engage the two parties in, in uh, Israel and Palestine to get on with the talks. Really, I think this leads me to something that was hot off the wire today about spreading uh, freedom in Afghanistan. I was so thrilled a few weeks ago uh, to see women voting Amazing. in Kabul and and Curtis and uh, and um, Kandahar. Excuse me for the, the city that is south and I guess uh, east of of Kabul. In Afghanistan, women and men lined up for hours to do what? Vote. vote. Something Exercise. that we take for granted. You're right. But to the Afghanis, this is a great opportunity, and I think that is an answer to terror. Uh, spreading democracy, and demo I'm going to use the word free enterprise, democratic free enterprise, uh, liberal democracies around the world, I think is an antidote to the, to the propagandists who say on Al Jazeera that the U.S. doesn't care about us. All they care about is our oil. Right. Uh, we've got to show people, we've got to win hearts and minds around yes. the world. You are such a patriot. And I'm, I love my country. You're, you're I, such an inspiration, yeah. Jack. I have to ask you what I ask everyone on PBS, um, though you're not prepared for it. What is the defining moment of your life? Getting married to the right woman 46 years ago. Um, being told by a college football coach that, yes, I could play pro football if I worked harder and studied more. Um, Going into politics, when everybody said I couldn't go from the football field into Congress, uh, I went out and tried it. and I, that. So I've had several defining moments. Excuse me for elaborating. But I really did. I really have had several defining moments in my life, all of which are associated with giving me the confidence and the faith in the future to never give up.
And what do you think was that something inside of you? You know, we're, we're always talking about statesmen and how difficult it, it is to find a true statesman. And you are a true statesman. What is that? How did you get that? Well, yes. I was taught by my mother, who was a strong Republican, uh, an Eisenhower, you know, Dewey, uh, uh, Reagan Republican, um, that I could disagree with somebody without being disagreeable. And uh, that I, uh, I was brought up in a liberal home, a li small L, classical liberal home, where art, music, books, debate, discussion, the mind, mm -hmm. the United Negro College Fund says is a terrible thing to waste. Well, my mother encouraged her four sons and my three brothers and me, A, to never give up, and B, to respect people, respect all religions, respect all people, uh, and get to know their culture, their religion, their hopes, their fears, their dreams and aspirations. I think that really was um, what defined our home and has helped define my view towards the rest of the world. What a wonderful woman your mother must have she been. She was a great lady. Great lady, created a great man. A good, uh, hopefully a mensch. Thank a good you guy. for being Thank with you. us. You are a mensch. Jack, from your football days to now, you have always run quarterback for the common citizen. You walk your talk and your stellar career reflects your stellar life. You are an inspiration. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Gail Gross. See you next time. We are PBS.